Paranormal Road has been brought to you by EVP Mediums. Visit us at evpmediums.com, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Exploring unknown regions of our reality. And she looks out and sees these lights in the sky and these different patterns drifting like they're going to land. Examining the depths of human perception. I, I started, I remember when I was awake and I realized I was awake, I started to sort of scan the room and I realized that something was, was wrong. Pursuing the elusive and unseen. Uh, electronics started acting up, ceased to work, overheated. You have just entered a road of wondrous mystery. And so when we get around this bend in the road and this group of trees, we look up in the sky and there's this craft and it is huge. A place where sometimes our darkest terrors dwell. I've never seen anything like this and instantly I could feel the fear. You've just turned on to the Paranormal Road. Paranormal Road. Welcome, you've just turned on The Paranormal Road. I'm your host, Dave Hemsley. And I'm your co-host, Randy Kessler. Tonight, we have a really uh, exciting show for you folks. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, one of my favorite subjects. Of course it is, David. It's all about cryptids. Yeah, but we're not isolating to just one cryptid this time. Uh, our guest tonight is Ronald Murphy, and he's sort of the cryptid guru he's had uh, so so many books written that he has written i i believe somewhere in the neighborhood about eight books uh we're going to be talking him tonight uh in a host of things from bigfoot to dog man to um, vampires and he actually has been i believe a guest speaker for uh the mothman convention yeah he's he's a pretty active in quite a few of the conventions he's highly sought after as a speaker he also has something going on at the Travel Channel. Maybe tonight we can get him to talk to us about uh, what he's been doing with the Travel Channel. But uh, before we get into tonight's uh, guest speaker, we have a Haddock's Report. Professional UFO investigator and special assignment reporter for Paranormal Road. It's the Haddock's Report. This is William Haddock for the Haddock's Report, and I've got a very interesting case to bring to you today. And actually, I'm the witness for a change. This happened on December 23rd, uh, 2019, and it was approximately 6.55 in the evening. A friend of mine had stopped over, and we were standing in my driveway, just talking and whatever. And I was facing the street, and he was, of course, facing away from the street. And I looked up in the sky and saw a very, very bright light. It appeared to be like a firework or even a flare. Uh, it was that extremely bright. Uh, pure white, no noise. Uh, I had been looking in the same direction the entire time. and never saw anything go up into the sky, but this one came down. And I'm estimating, due to other objects in the area and things, about a hundred foot uh, altitude when the object appeared. At a 45 degree angle, it fell. It disappeared uh, roughly two or three times in and out of uh, either some low-lying clouds or some haze. It's kind of hard to say. But it disappeared shortly, and I lost it behind some trees. The entire sighting lasted about three to four seconds, which was quite lengthy in my opinion for something of uh, that short of a distance so uh, there was extremely uh like i said sharp angle 45 degrees roughly no noise whatsoever nothing else that i could 
you know, make out just an extremely bright white object, but nothing like a falling star or anything natural, not that type of a light. But I believe the strobe effect, which happened three or four times, was due to it going in and out of some cloud cloud cover or haze is what the uh, weather actually was reported as at that moment when I looked back. It said there was some haze in the area. So it was extremely bright and I have no idea, you know, what it could possibly be. I've checked flight radars and things and nothing was in the air. There was a lot of uh, plane and helicopter activity, but they were all way t too far to the east or west. I could see all of those, you know, their lights and things fairly plain. There was no noise when it went out or anything. I don't have any idea of where it may have landed, but nothing went back up into the sky either. So it came down and that was the end of it. I have no clue, like I say, what it was or anything. I m made an image on uh, the website, which is Central Ohio UFO Reporting Center US. And if you click on Most Recent Reports tab, it'll be the very first report that you see, which is case number Z6. 42 LB and you can read the entire report and in the upper right corner of the same page you'll see images you can click on that and actually see what I drew out of the the travel of the object I took a Google Earth uh, image and drew it out so if anybody uh, you know has ever seen anything similar to this or has any uh, ideas of what it may or you know may be or anything you know, feel free to uh, either hit me up on Facebook at uh, Central Ohio UFO Reporting Center, or you can get in touch with Paranormal Road through Facebook as well, and they can get in touch with me, or through the website, which again is Central Ohio UFO Reporting Center dot US. And on the home page, there's a form you can fill out to directly contact me. And if you've got anything to report of your own. Feel free to also go to the reporting center and fill out a report, and I will be in touch within 24 hours or less, usually less. So that's all I've got for this week, uh, guys. Uh, if you've got any other comments or questions or anything regarding the podcast or the reporting center or anything in general, feel free to contact me, like I said, through Facebook or through the website itself. And as always, Keep looking up. And thanks, William, for that Haddock's report. And it's time to get the show on the road. Let's get Ron Murphy on the line. Ronald, welcome to the Paranormal Road. Welcome, Ron. <laughs> Hey, gentlemen, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm flattered that you had me on your program, and I'm looking forward to this. So thanks a lot again, guys. Oh, yeah, we're really excited about the show because, you know, I am, I'm a cryptid nut. I, I, everything yes, about is. cryptids, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I can't get enough about it. So this is one of the shows where I kind of sit on the edge of my seat. But we actually had the pleasure of meeting you uh, in Pennsylvania. At, at the uh, Bigfoot Camp Out, out yes. Yeah. Up that's on that right. mountain. That's, that's, that's right. That's right. It was a good time. I mean, there was a lot of good people there, a lot of good speakers. Um, it was actually a three-day event, which which you, you can't beat. I mean, you very rarely see this anymore. And it was an honor meeting you guys. But uh, the my favorite thing about doing conferences is getting to talk to people because very rarely, I mean, whenever you research this stuff, um, you will get to investigate reports and things. But to actually really sit down and talk to people, that's one of the reasons why I am so... So, uh, you know, so looking forward to all these kind of conferences. And the season, of course, is over now for the most part. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, those are one of my favorite things to do, and that's how I met you guys. Yeah, it was it was exciting. It was really cool. I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it would have been better if Randy Whitney got sick and we had to, <laughs> <laughs> had to book down the mountain. But he uh, apparently the altitude really affected yeah, him. Yeah, I, I had no idea. I felt so odd up there and dizzy and everything else. As soon as we'd come down off that mountain, I was fine. That's right. Well, the thing is, like, um, you know, whenever you think of places like Pennsylvania and Ohio, you really don't think of altitude. And we don't have altitude in relation to, like, say, um, you know, what you would have in Denver. Mm -hmm. But we have a significant 
you know, uh, the topography around here, there are significant height differences, and you can actually feel that in Pennsylvania. And, and whenever our list, you know, whenever you have listeners, a lot of people have never been to Pennsylvania before in Ohio. But I think that you gentlemen can attest that, um, you know, this place is pretty barren in a lot of areas. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of woods, yes. a lot of places where things can hide, and, and, and apparently they are hiding because reports come in daily about these things. Yeah, and, and people wouldn't, you know, if you're not from Pennsylvania, it's it's amazing how vast, uh, you know, uh, and wooded it is. That's right, and, that's right. Uh, but, uh, you know, speaking of Pennsylvania, you know, um, for, before we get into the Chestnut Ridge, because I'd like you to talk about that, but um, can you kind of give our, our listeners uh, a little bit scope of, of your credentials as far as background in the research of the paranormal and cryptids? Specifically. Well, absolutely. Encrypteds is my thing. You know, um, I, I, I was instilled from a very early age by my mother, who was an avid paranormal reader. Um, and that was the thing. Like, we would listen to the radio back then because KDKA out of Pittsburgh would have Stan Gordon on every now and then. Mm-hmm. And, so, you know, she would she would bring my, me over there and we would listen to his reports. And so many reports came from the Chestnut Ridge. So what we would do is if there was a sighting in the area, the next day my mother would load my brother and I up in the car and we would go looking at the places where the sightings were because they were all either in driving distance or in some cases almost literally in our backyard. So very early on, my mother had instilled this this belief in me uh, that there are things out there that, you know, really are not cataloged by science that we simply cannot explain that people are not nutcases that are reporting this there's something out there there's some yes. sort of phenomenon yeah. out there and um it, it was just a, it was a great place because the chestnut ridge has been a hot spot of paranormal activity for years i mean back in the 70s it was called the twilight zone of pennsylvania and um i grew up with seeing the chestnut ridge out my window i lived that close wow. and as as a matter of fact i still right now on the phone I'm looking at the Chestnut Ridge, mm-hmm. and we just bought a house. And if you can believe it, our house sits on the corner of Chestnut and Ridge. <laughs> so uh, it, it's always been one of those things. It's always been, you know, a part of of, of who I am. But you know, th- it, it whenever you get into high school, things are changing. But whenever I went to college, I went to the University of Pittsburgh, and um, I started to get very much into uh, Jungian psychology, and I started to uh, really have um, an admiration and a love for. Or the idea of the archetype mm-hmm. and as I explored I, archetype around the world you start seeing the incidences of wild men and you start seeing the incidences of you know even things like um, uh, you know werewolves you know mm-hmm. that, that appear in cultures around the world and that really kind of fired me up and then whenever I went to graduate school I went to uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania for graduate school in history and I was really able to go at the graduate level and look at a lot of different cultures around the world especially in shamanistic cultures that have these ideas of these intermediaries between one dimension and another and you know, more often than not, they take the form of a bipedal humanoid creature, and and it really looking at this from an ap- academic point of view, which is the way I do research and the way I write, um, that it it makes sense. And I wish mm-hmm. that more people were out there writing like this because it might be more acceptable in colleges. Because I, I will tell you, even if these things don't exist in the flesh and blood in the wilderness, they exist in the gray matter of our minds, and that's mm-hmm. worthy of study in and of itself. Yes, it is, and and, and that is the big question is, <clears throat> what is this phenomena, you know, as far as when you meet people and, and being up at the Bigfoot camp out and all the conferences you go to, you know, Randy will be the first to tell you he's the biggest skeptic was. He's a little bit different now after <laughs> meeting people in person, but to to see their faces their emotions right. you know something happened to them right it, 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 and that's a great point um invariably at any conference that i'm at and it doesn't mm-hmm. matter if i'm doing something in california i've been blessed that i get to do conferences all over the world so it doesn't matter where you go there's always going to be a guy that comes up to your table mm-hmm. a big guy you know probably some you know tattoos on his neck and everything somebody you wouldn't want to mess with in a bar mm-hmm. and he would come up and say you don't believe in this crap do you and i say i keep an open mind and you see him wander away and he comes back 15 minutes there's tears in his eyes and he wants to tell you his story. 
But he's afraid. You know, yeah. He's yeah. afraid. He's yeah. afraid. But it struck him so systemically that even the retelling of this is an emotional mm -hmm. thing for him, e even recounting this. So, mm -hmm. you know, that is not an archetype. That is something that is just simply not psychology. These people are witnessing something. Right. What that something is, is what we, I mean, that's why we're still skeptical. I've never seen anything. I, I, I've had a lot of anecdotal things happen to me, mm -hmm. things that I cannot explain. But the reason why we're still doing this, my friends, is because there's still a question mark out there. Right. Uh, and the it's not just one. It's not just Bigfoot. It's not, it's you know now you got uh, the Mothman. I mean you've That's had right. we've had it since sixties, but you know you throw in the Dogman. Uh, now this new cryptid that you know seems to be you know flooding the internet, the rake. You know, so we're getting a lot of sightings of these type of you know things. And right. uh, can you give our listeners a little bit of how many books have you written on these cryptids? Um, well, I have an on series, uh, which that I've written. Um, the first book that I wrote that gave me some notoriety, that got me on coast to coast and everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> was um, The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge. And I basically just recounted all the strange things that I've investigated, some of the things that happened to me, some of the eyewitness reports that I had. And I covered everything in there from Bigfoot and Dogman to Thunderbirds and UFOs and even fairy sightings. So mm -hmm. the books, books that I've written, I mean, again, I'm looking at the archetype of these things throughout history. Um, I started off with On Mermaids. I have On Wild Man, On Dog Man. Um, I have On Ghosts, which, of course, is you know is, uh, a favorite for everybody. Mm -hmm. I have On Aquatic Monsters of the Great Lakes. I have On Fairies. And I just uh, put out the bibliography today for my newest book that will be out probably by April, and that is called On Witches. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to look at all these different things. But... Um, uh, it, it is one of those things that I am so passionate about, not only because I had an interest as a kid and it's kind of, you know, nostalgic to look back on it, right. but even today, even today, I'm still getting um, reports. I'm still looking at the literature today that people are putting out and people are still writing about these things. People are still seeing these things. And then, you know, in, in 2020, you wouldn't think that people are still talking about seeing a hairy wild man out their window, mm -hmm. but they are seeing that even in the information age there is still this understanding that there's something out there in those liminal areas where we cannot grasp and we cannot fathom that there's still things lurking out there and does it seem to you it's um you know i'd like to say you know with the age of the internet and podcast but it seems as if these sightings are increasing not decreasing they, they're increasing they, in, in t tenfold that's right. Now, uh, as we said before, you know, looking at this skeptically, mm -hmm. if if people are going to be reporting these things, people are more apt to think if they hear something moving or hear a scream, it's something that they saw on TV or something they mm -hmm. read about on the Internet. That's right. one way of looking at it. But the other thing is we have so much technology in our pocket when we have the cell phone. People are bringing back recordings. You know, people are filming themselves out on a hike and there's these unexplained, unexplained screams occurring that nobody can figure out what's going on, you know, or the lights in the sky or objects moving in the house. Mm -hmm. You know, if the, inf the age of, of, te of technology is really helping us out as investigators to show that, you know, not only is there something out there that is not categorized by science, but maybe there's also uh, a connection between all these things as well, which makes it even more interesting, and it takes us even further down uh, uh, the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do think that shows such as, you know, Paranormal Road and Sasquatch Chronicles and the Goblin Universe, if you look at all the podcasts that have been going, you know, that have uh, re in recent years uh, been devoted to the paranormal subject, and then you got Finding Bigfoot, you have yep. Expedition Bigfoot, foot you have ghost hunters there seems to be i think the media is it's a double-edged sword uh because uh, but it seems like with the increased exposure maybe the environment now is making it a little bit more comfortable for people to come forward instead of keeping it bottled inside 
It, it is very, very much so. Um, now, I will tell you, and this is the first show that I'm actually uh, announcing it on. Um, I actually filmed a uh, series for uh, the Travel Channel. Um, it's a uh, an eight episode series I filmed out in California over uh, over the summer uh, that we are going to be looking at. It's going to be on uh, the Travel Channel. It, it debuted on Christmas Day. It was just one of those things that wasn't mm -hmm. advertised. They just threw it up there, but it will be actually out in March. And it's called True Tales of Terror, and it's uh, hosted by Robert England, who uh, you know the good old Freddy Krueger. Right. And, and what we're going to do in that series is we're going to look at old newspaper accounts of these kind of things and show that this is not um, something modern. This is something that's been around with us for a long time. So when we talk about Bigfoot, again, like like I said, right. or or even like a Mothman, when we talk about flying humanoids, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, 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 in my book on fairies, you can see where there are representations of flying humanoids in, in cave paintings and rock art that date mm -hmm. back you know 12 13 thousand years ago so this is not a modern thing this didn't happen at point pleasant this happened while we were still struggling for our very existence in the wild you know we were still encountering right. these types of things and i think that's I, oh man i can't wait to see the show because that is one of the things that i used to encounter when i would talk to people about you know again i wasn't a hundred percent sure about bigfoot or cryptids but it was something i was interested in. and then of mm -hmm. course after we started our show and interviewed people and, and it's like oh wait a minute something's going on here but one that's of the right. things that would come to mind is okay well if that's if they're really there why are they not why don't we have it in history as far as the, with the colonists or and then to find out we do they call oh, them the wild man that's right and, that's right and, and, and not only that I mean it, it depends on what vernacular we we're talking about a lot of people overlook Native American accounts because they think it's superstitious you know that's not the case mm -hmm. or if you would look at Viking accounts even you know the scralings you know mm -hmm. which was something that was reported whenever um, you know the Vikings landed up in uh, in the Newfoundland area of, uh, of Canada, there's been encounters with, with these things ever since people came to America, you know, right. we're talking about these kind of swarthy type of individuals. Um, now, there, there are a lot of good researchers out there that say that this is encounters with the native population. You know, that's what would make sense to them. But there is so much more into these encounters that doesn't fit the bill. I mean, of, of course, mainstream academia is going to look for the the easiest answer because they don't right. want to say that they're talking about something else. So the kind of things that I like to point out is whenever we're talk, talking about the very nascent of, of, of literature, whenever people were able to actually sit down and start writing a, a system, a phonetic alphabet, and we look at the Mesopotamian culture mm -hmm. and the idea of linear B, which is something, you know, this, this cuneiform type of, of wedge-shaped writing, what the first people set down on paper was the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, not on paper, but on, but, but on uh, you know, on uh, in, in stone. Right. And Epic of Gilgamesh has a character in there called Enkaidu, which is described as a bipedal, hair-covered creature that runs with the animals, you know, drinks out of, out of, you know, out of ponds and things like that. So we're going back to the time before the pyramids. When people mm -hmm. were writing about this kind of stuff. And then, you know, whenever you look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles and you look at, at things like Beowulf and the, the, the character of Grundle in there, people want to look at this stuff as literature, but they don't want to look at the 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 concept behind these certain characters, you know. Um, and, and it's fascinating to me. I mean, that's really what keeps me going because I have such a love for history and I have such a love for literature and to bring all this kind of stuff together and really start connecting the dots. You know, we're finding out that, well, it's strange that uh, the Native American uh, uh, cultures in the Pacific Northwest had the same concept of a wild man that they did in you know in devon england mm -hmm. or you know or in siberia you know these far-flung cultures or and then what do you do about australia that was so isolated for so long but they still have the concept of a yaoi creature right. there as well right. so yeah it really it really it really transcends us as human beings it, yes. it truly does yes it does and we're going to pick up on that it's i'm um, getting the signal it's time for break already and we will return shortly with Ronald Murphy and more on the Paranormal Road.
Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the Ohio Grassman. It is said he lurks deep in the forests of the American heartland. Hundreds have encountered him. Join us at Buckeye Bigfoot, where we tell the stories of those true encounters. I'm Nance Horn, your host and narrator at Buckeye Bigfoot. Look us up on YouTube. Just search for Buckeye Bigfoot. Then come sit with us for a while while we tell you stories of the undisputed king of the forest. The state of Ohio is filled with mysteries. Unsolved murders and unexplained disappearances, lost treasures, missing shipwrecks, strange phenomenon, and things that go bump in the night. We explore them all at Ohio Mysteries, a podcast dedicated to the great questions that obsess us in the Buckeye State. I'm your researcher and storyteller, Paula Schleiss. And I'm your co-host, Steve Yoder. We invite you to join us every week for a new episode about a mystery that's never been solved. You'll find stories that seem vaguely familiar, others that have become legend, and still, more you've never heard of. Subscribe to Ohio Mysteries on your favorite podcast app. Or visit us at ohiomysteries.com for direct links, as well as photos, videos, news clippings, and more related to each and every episode. And who knows, maybe together we'll find some missing pieces to these puzzles on Ohio Mysteries. Welcome back to the Paranormal Road with Ron Murphy. Ron, in the first part of the show here, you brought up fairies. And I have an interest in in that area only because we had gone on an investigation. And I saw creatures in, in one of our clients' homes that I wasn't sure about. And after the investigation, we talked about it a little bit. And I, I kind of think they were elementals. And I'm not real keen on that, so I thought maybe you could help us out with that and see how it possibly ties in. Well, you know what? We talked last segment as well, too, about my interest in connecting the dots. And I think that this is a great point to start connecting some dots. So whenever we talk about the idea of elementals, I had a gentleman came up, come up to me at a conference one time. And, you know, he was very reluctant to tell me the story, but he said he was hiking on the Chestnut Ridge. Um, and, you know, it was just one of those days where you were out hiking and he came to this little glen and he saw these two creatures that were wrestling with each other. They did not notice him. He was just, you know, he kind of sat there and watched them for, you know, several moments, you know. And um, he said he could not describe if they had any clothes on. If they did have clothes, it was very kind of, you know, naturalistic and very, very, um, you know, uh, it, it looked like the surroundings, you know. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't describe any clothes, but he called them brownies. Now, hmm. of course, you know, with, with Harry Potter and everything that's going on, that's really part of our consciousness now. And brownies in the Middle Ages were usually um, situated on a particular habitation. These were usually house type of spirits, but he described them as brownies. And what he said was, this is one that starts getting very interesting is that um the one creature saw him and immediately took off and disappeared in the side of the hill and he pointed out that there was no hole or fissure in the side of the hill it just simply disappeared in the side of the hill but the other creature did not the other creature went through an inventory of shape shifts and it became a very large bird and it took off Hmm. now yeah now what's interesting is in county clare in ireland there is a fairy over there that us often assumes the shape of a very large eagle. 
And in Western Pennsylvania, we get a lot of, which is strange, Thunderbird sightings. And mm -hmm. if there are Thunderbird sightings out there, these animals are so large, they would actually be picked up on aviation radar. So what what's going on? I mean, is it something elemental? Now, also the idea of like poltergeist hauntings. If we were back in the Middle Ages, we wouldn't say that that was a ghost. We would say that there was a fairy in the house. Hmm. Um, we, we forget about these kind of things right. because uh, what the Victorians did to the fairies is they made them into these little Tinkerbell creatures. But it was not until relatively recently, until the very late 1800s, at the end of the Victorian period, that these creatures were something that were seen as almost something to fear. You definitely did not want to mess around with them. And if you did have one, of it, well, one in your house, you wanted to appease them and placate them as much as possible but that was very interesting so i'm starting to think about whenever i go through all these like legends in europe um there are the idea of haunted forests over there but they're not haunted they're 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 fairy haunted is the word that they would use and a lot of times you knew that there was a fairy around because of the wood knocking sounds which of course is part of the bigfoot right, folklore right. you know so and, and i have another interesting tell to tell us too and i actually was able to investigate this particular area and this was in scotland it was in Stirlingshire, scotland so right in the middle and um there was a gentleman by the name of robert kirk who lived a little right around the time of william shakespeare so we're talking about the elizabethan period and um he you know he was a man of God. He had, you know, no superstitions or anything like that. But he recounted that he was out for a walk one evening. And at the side of the hill, um, a light emanated from the side of the hill as if a door opened. And he looked into it. And there were two different type of creatures in there. One was a very large, you know, beautiful type of human being, what we would describe as a Nordic. Mm -hmm. And the other creature in there was this smaller little little creatures that we would describe as a gray mm -hmm. but he saw this as a fairy encounter so i mean are we dealing with extraterrestrials or are we dealing with something that could be from the fairy realm something that's you know interdimensional or elemental at the very least so this is the kind of things that i like to, to, to research as well too are we dealing with something that can assume a form or we're wait for it guys or are we dealing with a creature that is able to project into our mind something that it wants us to see yeah, that's an interesting that is that is very thought. interesting but yeah <laughs> yeah creepy um, yeah, and that's the, I mean, the reason why people were saying, you know, we, we, we had our camera and we have these ideas like blob squatches and things. Are they actually photographing just raw energy? And very rarely does that that form take any kind of shape on, on film or on digital, you know, digital processing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's so mind-blowing, the whole thing. And what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts on interdimensional beings? Well, um, I, I, one time I was very much against it. The idea of a flesh and blood animal is what made sense to me. Mm -hmm. People are finding footprints. You know, some people report finding, you know, scat and things. Now, have you ever, uh, you know, in your time in the woods, have you come across any footprints or any uh, tree knockings or screams? Oh, absolutely. All the above. All the above. Mm -hmm. Screams, something following me in the side of the woods that I couldn't explain, the things snarling at me, which I've witnessed, mm -hmm. but I never saw anything. So then we have to think about the idea of things like infrasound you know is there something out there and that's the other thing we, when we talk about interdimensionality or we talk about fairies and things assuming shapes i don't want to say it almost in a science fictional parlance i want to find some sort of um scientific um explanation for these things so when we talk about things like infrasound Mm -hmm. We know about infrasound is because it has such a military component. Right. And we know that our military uses infrasound because we can project non-violently at a combatant, you know, mm -hmm. feelings of dread. We know that this, this happens. So there may be uh, a, a, an animal or some sort of living creature out there that through time, co-evolution evolving alongside of us knowing that it, it needs to stay away from us in order for survival and it projects into us something that is our fears our our, our darkest fears you know mm -hmm. um so i've never seen anything but i've heard a lot of things and i've also felt a lot of things that's the other thing i think a lot of times you'll hear people say that i felt something or i felt something hit me in the chest before this happened that very very well could be the use of infrasound on the human body, and that is the way the human body reacts. 
I've even heard of people, you know, their bladder is emptying or their bowels, right, you know, right. emptying, you know, these kind of things. So it seems that there's more out there than just seeing something. It seems that there is something almost projected onto us. Now, infrasound is, uh, again, we know that whales use infrasound. We know tigers and lions mm-hmm. and elephants and crocodiles use it. So we know that mammals use it as well as reptiles. So if if it's part of the the known catalog of animals, why couldn't an unknown animal out there use this? And one of the reasons why it's elusive and why we don't get close is because whenever people sense this kind of feeling, they just simply don't go any further. Right. Turn around and run. I would. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. See, that's the thing. And, and I have felt things. I've been on investigations when, I, when I've when i heard very low rumbling noises followed by a smell. So we could even throw in the use of pheromones as well, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. But I knew instinctually, as if you know, my DNA was crying out, this is something that you don't want to go and investigate any further. Um, I think I think it's logical uh, to think that there's creatures out there like that. Um, and I think that it's also very logical that if we're dealing with an animal that is, you know, and again, you don't want to sound like you're talking about Star Trek or Star Wars. Right. I don't want to say something that's made out of energy, but something that's able to use um, particular types of defense mechanisms to um, make itself seem something that it's not. Um, the idea of fairy lore, though, um, I also investigated up in the, the, the Scottish Highlands something called the Gray Man. And sometimes it can uh, appear in the shape of a fog, or sometimes it can take the form of a 20 foot uh, bipedal, hair covered humanoid. Hmm. So, again, but, but, but they consider that as a fairy. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that's an awfully so the, big fairy, though. <laughs> and it, well, well, the thing is, it, the belief is that it's really not that size. The belief is that it's assuming a form to keep us out of that area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that the idea of glamour that's a, that's a, a medieval term, you know, and we still have that because you know, women, you know, glamour magazines they call it glamour now is because women can appear as something that they're not. But in the Middle Ages, glamour was a, a way for something to take on a form to appear differently than what it actually was. Well, speaking of glamour, um, they, I believe that's a term that vampires use when they it, glamour uh, you. Absolutely. Now, um, my book uh, on vampires, uh, Bram Stoker, I mean, without Bram Stoker, we would have had um, the vampire as part of our cultural war, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. But he's one that really kind of you know, opened up the floodgates on vampires now he was from ireland and originally he wanted to call dracula uh count vampire which is you know a uh, we're talking about an eastern european word here but he called it dracula and i was i i, I really never could understand we, we have the idea of the dracul we have the idea of, of uh, vlad the impaler mm-hmm. but what is interesting in Irish fairy folklore, there is a fairy called the Dracula, the D-R-A-Y-C-O-L-A, I believe is the way, but of course we're dealing with, with Gaelic, uh-huh. so of, of, of course, but, but it, it comes out phonetically as Dracula, and this was a fairy that would wait in the desolate areas for travelers, and it would feed off of their blood. Wow. So I, I'm I'm positive he used that as part of his uh his um you know his uh rendering of uh, of Dracula. Right. It's probably where he came up with the creation or the name of it. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, nothing exists in a vacuum. Uh, even, uh, you know, Stephen King is still drawing off of the past mm-hmm. to inform, you know, uh, inform us now because this stuff is still scary. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I really think that when we talk about all these different things, it's hard for me as a researcher and a hard for me as a skeptic to think that we have three or four different apex predators out there occupying one geographical area. But what does make sense to me is there's a creature out there that does not want to be discovered and it's projecting itself as something to stay away. So instead of thinking about a Bigfoot or thinking about a a, a dog man, is it plausible that there is a creature out there that's able to represent itself as that to just to simply keep us away? Uh, by my, yeah, through your mind, pulling yeah, up. Yeah, through your mind, that's right. Fear. Um, <clears throat> now, with vampires, I'm a little bit interested, in, and maybe you can answer with your research, but years ago I took a trip down to New Orleans, and uh, we were on a company you know, recruiting trip, and I was really shocked at the culture down there, the vampire culture. 
And uh, can you tell us uh, when did, you know, taking out you know, the uh, vampire diaries and and, mm. and the like, uh, when did vampires or vampirism in the United States, when did, what's the earliest recordings that you have of that? Well, there was actually a, a vampire scare uh, in New England of all places. Hmm. Now, I will, I'll give you a little bit of the background story, and then I will tell you when this happened. Um, the vampire scare started actually up in Maine, and it swept the whole way down to Connecticut. And we can find um, uh, graves to this day that has vampire listed on it, and we can find um, you know remnants of graves that were torn open and the head you know, the, the head posthum uh, posthumously, of course, uh, removed or a stake driven through their heart. We can find this in New England. Oh. Um, and because now, uh, of course, as a researcher, uh, there was also tuberculosis uh, ravaging the area. Mm -hmm. And that was back in the day was called consumption because it looked like somebody was feeding off the body. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the best cases was a case by the name of Mercy Brown. And this happened up in New Hampshire. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not New Hampshire. It happened in Rhode Island. And um, you know, the family started to die. Uh, the little daughter died. Um, the son got sick. So they, the dad and the townspeople knew the remedy was to dig up the family and find out who was coming back to feed on, on the living. And they found poor Mercy Brown still had blood in her body. Um, so like any good father, they, uh, they ripped out her heart. Uh, they burned it down to ash and they mixed it with water and they gave it to the son who was sick to drink hoping that this would cure his illness and keep the vampire away. Now, unfortunately, he passed away. Yeah. But when we talk about these kind of stories, this sounds like something that would have happened in the 1600s, you know, uh -huh. contemporaneous with the Salem witch trials. This actually happened in 1892. Oh We're my, <laughs> my great grandmother was born in 1890, and she died in 1977. So I knew her. You know, yeah. I had a great relationship with, with her. But the thing is, though, that this was going on at a time whenever professional football was being played, basketball was invented in that year. You know, we're not talking about ancient history. We're talking about a very modern world with educated people that were thinking that vampires were still prowling about in 1892. That's just crazy. It is. And that's crazy. really it's that's not that far back. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, no. you, you check just check out local history and in, in small towns, and there's things that were going on then that are still going on now from the 1890s. Oh. With, without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, there's a place not too far away where I live right now called Vampire Road. <laughs> and I've been researching that, trying to find the, the answer. And uh, it was one of those things where the road, you know, is quite old and people forgot why it's named that. But, you know, these are very interesting little landmarks on the American um, landscape. Uh, and like you said, that it happened in the past, but people still have the memory of it, the folk tales of it, or in some instances, even, you know, still going on right regular instances instances yeah incidents of these things happening mm -hmm. um speaking of incidents and i want to kind of shift gears just slightly a little bit uh but you you mentioned earlier about uh flying humanoids what is your take yes. on um, uh, the mothman well, the Mothman is one of those interesting creatures. Uh, again, if it uh, and I, I had the opportunity to speak at Point Pleasant. I, I, I spoke at the Mothman Festival a couple of years ago. Um, it, it's a huge draw. Um, it's one of those things that's unexplained. We do know that the Silver Bridge collapsed. We know that there was a, a winged humanoid um, sighted there as well, too. But if you would go back a couple hundred years before that, we also forget that not very far from this area, we have the Pine Barrens in New Jersey, where mm -hmm. the the uh, the, the um, uh, yeah the, the Jersey Devil was reported as well too. Um, but there are these ideas of flying humanoids. We have the Owl Man that was part of the Celtic culture, the pre-Christian Celtic culture in 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 England, and we have these ideas in India of flying humanoids. Um, and of course, if you would look at at, um, you know, great Egyptian pictographs, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of their tombs were decorated with these beautiful female figures that have these great, you know, uh, golden wings. So, you know, this is something, again, like I said, that's been part of us for so long. Um, when we talk about the idea of the Banshee in Irish folklore, this is a, 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 a harbinger of omens, of things to come. And that's the way our Mothman has become in America. But that's, again, not a, a isolated case people have seen these flying humanoids 
for years and they just go uh -huh. by different names yeah that's where you know and again i'm not so convinced that you know if this flying creature mothman does exist i'm not so convinced i don't know if it's a matter of the book called the prophecy so it's stuck there but like uh recently they have been seeing you know a winged flying creature in chicago what for the, almost, right. almost for the last two years and they're still getting right. reports and with, without a doubt yeah. without a doubt people are still seeing this stuff so something's going on there but i'm thinking okay if this is a harbinger of you know prediction you know there thank god and i don't want there to be but there hasn't been anything really bad that's happened in chicago so i i, I don't know i'm a little bit uh, not sure that you know it, it is an omen or a sign of of something negative to come and i think as well, far as it not being seen after the silver bridge collapse I don't think anybody <laughs> would, you know, their hearts are broken. People, there wasn't a person in that town that didn't know somebody that died. That's you know? right. That's right. And I think that the Mothman gets a bad rap because, you know, looking through all the research and everything, I think that was just a, a coincidence of what happened. I think there was something strange going on down there, mm -hmm. and there was some sort of faulty engineering on a on a bridge that collapsed, and it was just all. And, and we we put it together. You know, right. human beings like to put patterns together, and they think, oh, well, you know, that was why this was going on, and that simply probably was not the case. It was probably just, you know, a, something very bad happened uh, in co inciting with uh with these sightings now chestnut ridge how far away is that from the uh, uh point pleasant area uh from the well th this is an interesting thing as well too point pleasant sits on the appalachian plateau which geographically speaking geologically speaking is the same area as the chestnut ridge mm -hmm. yeah. um, now have there been reports of a mothman in chestnut ridge or is uh, that well, uh, more yeah. of the uh thunderbirds uh, there's Thunderbirds here, but now on the Chestnut Ridge, but about about 35 miles north of the Chestnut Ridge is an area called Butler, Pennsylvania. And people have been reporting probably for the past five or six years of a gargoyle being seen there, a flying gargoyle. Hmm. Now, um, if any of your listeners care, you could probably Google it and find it. It looks like a rather ominous figure. It, it, it's dressed in black. It has what looks to be like either a cape or some sort of, you know, wings down across its back. And also has um, a rather weird shaped head that goes back into almost a point. Now, as a researcher, what it looks like to me is we might be dealing with somebody that was trying out a wingsuit. I think mm -hmm. the, the helmet looks almost too aerodynamic, and I think what they're seeing is a wingsuit. Uh, I know they've come down in price. Uh, there are daredevils out there that would try it. It might have been even somebody on a hang glider, because I know as a kid, my cousin and I used to make hang gliders all the time. We were never able to get off the ground. But, I mean, I think what the butler gargoyle looks like is some misrepresentation or some misidentification mm -hmm. of something that was going on but that doesn't make it, it what's so uh important about this is people identified it as a flying gargoyle mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's what's so important about it but yeah in this area we do it, that, that's what's so incredible about this area one of the reasons why i truly stay in this area is because if i want to investigate anything from a dogman and ghosts you know to anything um i don't have to go very far sometimes i don't even have to even get in the car and i can investigate <laughs> so yeah so this is a good place to be i tell you it is beautiful country up there. i was just uh, blown away of the beauty of the land no, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It's good people, too. Yeah, and I'll tell you, though, going down some of those back roads, yeah, I could see where, you know, some people, I can see where the imagination would run wild because some of those back roads are creepy as far as, you know, they're isolated, they're covered by cliffs and hills and trees, and uh, at dusk, it's pretty pretty damn scary. <laughs> oh, it really is. It really is. And, you know, I, I, I'm not an avid hunter, but I'll go out with my dad every now and then. And I know that we go into places and I will have a gun on me mm -hmm. and I still feel sometimes a little spooked, you know. I, I don't know what's going on with that. I mean, it's just because of my years of investigation or, you know, is there something out there telling me, Projecting, you know, don't come yeah. any farther? Exactly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And you also in the Chestnut Ridge, there's a lot of abandoned mines in that area from what I understand. Oh, my goodness. There's not only mines but there's also stone quarries and just the way um the formation of this area there are caves everywhere not not massive case cave systems but i mean you can find chambers anywhere so if you wanted to stay hidden you can definitely stay hidden around here there's no question about it 
Unreal. Well, I cannot believe again how fast time goes. <laughs> uh, it's like we, we definitely have to have you back on the show. Um, but right now, I'd like you to you know take some time and tell our listeners because I know they're just as fascinated as I am uh, you know with with this show and and listening to you. How can they learn more about you? Where can they buy your books? Uh, where can they see uh, you on uh, the Travel Channel? Yep, Travel Channel. It will be a regular series. It will start in uh, in March. Um, again, True Tales of Terror, hosted by Robert England. Um, and it, there's a lot of good episodes that are going to be coming out there. Unfortunately, I can't divulge any sure. of the titles, but uh, it, it, it's it's going to be really really cool. Um, ranging everything from ghosts to uh, to Bigfoot to uh, to giant flying reptiles. So you're going to be really pleased with the series. I think I can't wait um, to watch it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I have a website. You can look me up at uh, uh, RonaldMurphyJr.com. Um, you can buy my books on Amazon. But I will tell you what: if any of your listeners out there really want to get in touch with me and they want to buy a book off of me, I can probably give it to them cheaper than uh, that Amazon would sell it to them, and I can even sign it for them and write a little note, and I'll send it out to them, Wonderful. no problem. But uh, they can go to uh, simply just email me. So that would be Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. That's my personal email. It bings right on my phone. If anybody wants to talk to me, if anybody wants to, you know, give me a sighting or, you know, or even argue and debate, that's part of our business <laughs> as well, too. Yeah, feel free to give me. So it's so a Ronald L. Don't forget the L. And then Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. And you can get in touch with me that way. Uh, you can like me on Facebook at uh, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. That's my author page. And uh, yeah, so uh, I'll be a little bit out of commitment mission until april and then my first uh my first um time in april will be uh i'll be at uh, the littleton um paranormal conference in uh north carolina which is one of my favorites then i'll be at the butler paranormal festival in butler pennsylvania and then um yeah so yeah but that's the the two that will be coming up in the next few months sounds like you got a, a really uh packed calendar there that's awesome uh, I do. I'm, I'm excited. I, this has been a passion for me. Whenever I go to the conferences, I go there as a fan, and I'm, you know, I'm in awe of a lot of the people that I, I get to talk with. You know, Ken Gearhart is one of my favorite researchers, and he's going to be down a little to North Carolina with me, and I'm looking forward to that. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, come out and talk with me if I if I get a chance to meet you, and if you're in an area where I'm not going to be at, uh, feel free to drop me an email. I'm looking forward to talking to anybody about this. I have no no, uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, it's not like I'm unapproachable. You know, definitely just drop me a line and we'll chat. Sounds great. Great. And Ron, we can't thank you enough for being on the Paranormal Road, and we will definitely have to have you back on soon. Thanks so much, gentlemen, Ron, for I'm coming on the show. To... Hey, thank you very much. I had a blast. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Very Thanks. good. Thanks. If you've enjoyed tonight's show, or if you enjoy Paranormal Road in general, and would like to support the show, you can do so by giving us a rating or review on wherever you get your podcast. By doing so, you help push us up in the search engines so others can find us on the Paranormal Road. Along with that, we like sharing just about any interesting out-of-the-ordinary story. I particularly would like to hear about some near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences or just unusual happenings in your life. So please, if you have something to share, get a hold of us. And you can also help us out by telling your friends about Paranormal Road. Put us on Facebook, share with your friends. The more people that discover the Paranormal Road, the more it helps us uh, get more interesting topics and guests for you. And until next week, please be safe on your travels down the Paranormal Road.